What is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Pile Driver Podcast. I am one of your hosts, Daniel, joined by my other two co-hosts. Your boy, Chris. And Berman. All right. And we have quite a bit to talk about. So to begin this uh, podcast, we're going to be talking about something quite interesting. So John Moxley, formally, again, formally known as Dean Ambrose, uh... Let has joined AEW about three years ago. He debuted at Double or Nothing in 2019. And ever since then, he has been one of AEW's premier wrestlers. He was the AEW champion uh, for the majority of the empty arena days, the pandemic days. He basically uh, is even regarded as, to date, the best AEW champion we've had so far. So, with all of that being said... Oh, yeah, and, and, and on top of AEW, he also has his things with Japan, GCW. Basically, you could find him in multiple different wrestling promotions. So why is it that everyone is so close-minded and wants Dean Ambrose back? I, I don't know. I really don't know. And let me just say this, right? John Moxley has gone record over and over and over again how... He was mistreated by WWE. And I'll even go as far as to say he was treated worse than CM Punk was in WWE. So, here's the thing. People want to turn on Cody Rhodes for going to WWE, but that's an entirely different situation, okay? Cody Rhodes has the family legacy right there, right? And his time wasn't as miserable as Dean Ambrose was, all right? So, with all that being said, Dean Ambrose was a comedy character. He was often regarded as the mid-card and weakest link in the Shield, while Roman and Rollins got multiple Mania main events, multiple championships, other successes. Dean Ambrose didn't get nearly as much as they've gotten over the years. Dean Ambrose matched with Brock Lesnar. He only got one match with Brock Lesnar, and it was a joke. Rollins and Reigns have both gotten to beat Brock Lesnar multiple times. So, with all that being said, WWE never saw Dean Ambrose as their top guy. They never cared about him as their top guy. And they never let him have any sort of say in his character or his creative control. That's why he was getting needles shoved up his ass within the last few months of his, you know, run in WWE. I am just saying... His run was not fun. It was not entertaining. And he was he's one of my favorite wrestlers alive. So with all of that being said, I want nothing more than happiness for him. Not another fucking S.H.I.E.L.D. reunion. And here's the thing about the S.H.I.E.L.D., right? The S.H.I.E.L.D. is dead. Roman Reigns has evolved as a character, as a speaker since then. Seth Rollins has evolved as a character and as a speaker since then. And John Moxley, I could say the same thing. So, all three men individually are doing better work than they were ever doing in the Shield. But why is it that all you Shields want Dean Ambrose to return to WWE? For, for, for what? Because nostalgia. For what? For his misery? Nostalgia, for his... man. But what nostalgia? He was miserable. He was a mid Carter. He was a fucking joke. There's no nostalgia with Dean Ambrose. But Daniel, there's if people, people on Twitter. There are Twitter people that cannot be reasoned with. You should know better. True, that is true. But at the end of the day, the Shield wasn't as good as the Four Horsemen. The Shield wasn't as good as Evolution. Hell, I'll even offend more snowflakes. They're about just as good as the New Day. That's how relevant they are. Oh, but the New Day is one of the best of all time. Nah, shut up. Everyone's been wanting them split for five years plus, and they're still together. That's whack. And I'm just saying, we would be looking at the Shield game, breaking up, then back together, breaking up, back together, breaking up, back together, all for Dean to be the weak link. I don't fucking get that. And I'll even go as far as to say this. The Blackpool Combat Club is way fucking cooler than the shield ever was. Oh, we're the we're the hounds of justice. We're gonna follow the authority and contradict everything we fucking say. They were not good fucking characters. You people don't know shit about storytelling. So with all of those things being said, at the end of the day, there is a lot to enjoy about John Moxley in the wrestling world. Okay, the shield sucks. They are not 
neither of those three were at their peak while in the shield. So forget about it. Fucking forget about it. It's whack. And no one, no one with a brain or with intelligence wants to see that bullshit again. So, end of my rant there. Now, I got a good question for you both. Is Walter slash Gunther <laughs> going to be successful in the WWE? Hell no. It's not going to happen. I'm, I love Walter, but they never give any respect to any of the UK guys. And you can see that when Finn Balor got kind of shoved up the ass a lot. Like, I hate how they treat UK people. Like, sometimes they get UK people a bad rap. I just want Walter to come back into doing other things than freaking uh, main roster. Like, going back to NXT UK is so much better. Or maybe going to a different promotion that make him serve better. I would completely say that. Chris, anything you have to say? I mean, like you said before, like, I, I don't know what it is, Berman, but when it comes to many of these NXT dudes, uh, does, does this seem weird to you that Vince just kind of hates them? Or like, yeah, he'll put them all in the front, but he'll just make them more of a joke than anything? Because I, yeah. I've i seen him as Walter, so I haven't really seen what they've done with this whole stupid Gunther character. But from what I've well, seen, he's just like a mid-jobber, right? As of right now? Well, I wouldn't say that. Right now, they they basically brought him up to SmackDown. Ludwig has basically been like his manager and essentially uh he's just been jobbing people out uh I, this is what i will say about walter slash gunther this is how i see his path going in WWE. i think he may get a mid-card title win and then fall into relevancy then get released it's going to happen. There's no doubt it's probably going to happen. I just want Walter to get out and just let go on to something better, successful yeah. than the WWE yeah. right now. I get that. So, yeah, I think that sums that up. Now, is it just me or does WWE just not care about, stadium, about non-stadium shows? I mean, like, think about it like this, right? We got Money in the Bank, SummerSlam, uh, the UK show, and then a Saudi Arabia show in October. So that's basically four straight months of stadium shows. So right now, WrestleMania Backlash, basically the entire card is nothing except a bunch of rematches from WrestleMania 38, except one match is original. And it's Mad Cat Moss versus Happy Corbin. The best. It's a good match, just gotta say. So, yeah. I just have to say it, though. This card it just suffers from a massive lack of originality. No original matches. Roman looks like he's not even defending the title on this show. So, what, you combine both championships, just, you know, let's say this, right? If Roman missed the show, you could have at least had one other title match. Oh, wait, that's not a possibility anymore because these stupid idiots decided to only have one champion. But, with that being said... If Ro uh, Roman isn't hurt, so why is he not defending the belt at WrestleMania Backlash? Because he has no opponents as of yet. Well, seems like it. I mean, they're setting up a Drew McIntyre match from the looks of it because they taped SmackDown last week. And it looks like uh, you might be seeing them on the same screen tomorrow on SmackDown. So the oh. entire... So they entirely ditched Shinsuke Nakamura uh, as a possible opponent for what is now going to be Drew McIntyre. That's probably going to be the Hell in a Cell opponent. And then we're probably going to get Randy Orton in July. And then whoever wins that will probably go fight Cody at SummerSlam. Yeah, let me say this on the bad. There might be a small explanation of maybe why Bowman is not in bigger matches at WrestleMania Backlash, and the only idea I thought is maybe he's still recovering from that match without uh, being in front of the TV. He's only on live matches because he's trying to regain his arm, maybe he's trying to, trying to regain some control because, remember, he did get hurt in that match not 
maybe he's trying to recover the arm before any bigger matches come up. Right. Just the thing I don't understand, though, is, like, if he was, like, full-blown hurt, why is he still competing, like, three, four times a week at live events? Because Vince. You know Vince, man. He all cares about is the money at the end of the day. I mean, like, listen, I love Roman as the champion, especially the double champion. It just it feels very right in this universe. However, and I do say however, you can't have the champion not defend the belt at a, at a pay-per-view. That's just not traditional, fan. So, yeah. Uh, hopefully, they do something with Roman. Screw it. If it is Drew McIntyre and they just literally have a two-week build, then okay, fine. Just at least it's something. <laughs> but only two weeks? See, that's not going to build anything. Well, actually, no, that's not maybe... true. Punk and Kingston where we only had like two weeks and look what magic they made out of that. True. Uh, another idea is too, they probably might just recover what happened at Survivor Series a good time ago when uh, Roman Reigns cheated against uh, Drew McIntyre for to win. To yeah. probably want to get rematch again. It's pretty simple. And I see... I see Roman probably cheating the win at Backlash if they fight, and then at Hell in a Cell, they'll probably fight inside the Hell in a Cell with a longer build behind it where Roman will win clean. But who knows? Who knows where to go with it? Uh, so, yeah. Now, a few weeks ago, uh, we talked about a certain someone who uh, accidentally, or maybe not accidentally, uh, killed a man on the highway in a car in a three-way car crash. Basically, she has finally responded to the uh, to everything that has happened. And boy, oh boy, this is uh, this is this is quite the response. So this was on Twitter, and she was responding to a fan as well, and she said, "Hmm, about ten miles per hour since I was slowing down." to the light but he had a heart attack nothing to do with my seizure and yeah basically showing zero responsibility or zero sympathy over the man that she killed in the car crash uh, oh. quite quite interesting right there from a WWE Hall of Famer I must say uh, the tweet has only one retweet and five likes to an astounding 52 negative responses the good thing about that. At least people have so, sense. So yeah, I was right to call her out a few weeks ago on the podcast for being a bad human being. Because yeah, she literally will not take responsibility for any of her actions in this situation whatsoever. And even lied about the speed limit she was going to in that tweet as well. So... I, I just... I'm not even going to comment on that because I don't really feel the need to. She embarrassed herself. Now, uh, we don't talk about NXT ever, but there were uh, huge allegations that hit Nash Carter recently, and essentially, I was very worried about where Wesley is going to go from here, And because, you know, I, I thought it really wouldn't have been right if Wesley ended up getting sidelined, uh, you know, just because of what his tag team partner might have did. So... Essentially, he's finally getting that second chance. He's having a solo run. And basically, he had a huge promo this week talking, you know, about, uh, you know, winning the championship just for it to be taken away from you. Not, not even that he lost, but to have it be taken away from you. And you felt the hunger and the frustration from this promo. And all I got to say is, I don't care for 2.0, but God damn it. Do, do Wesley, do Wesley some justice. God damn it. He has so much potential to be one of the best stars in this upcoming next generation. Wesley is, is just so talented. Don't, don't waste that potential, please. That is all I have to say. So, thoughts on Wesley finally being a singles competitor after all this? It, it, I, 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 I like it myself. Sorry. Uh, I like it myself. I remember when he was in Impact. He was a great singles competitor. He was a X Division champion. Weren't they like the Rascals? Um, yes. Him and, but, him and Nash. Yes, he was, but he did have a title run 
as the X Division title uh, champion, and he was pretty good at it. He was a great champion. He lost it against Ace Austin, if I'm not correct. Uh, but it was great, and I think if he gives a good solo run, he could go for another championship. Yeah, like, I would love to see Wesley as a North American champion. I would love that. But, yeah, so Chris, you remember MSK, of the great tag do. team? Great. Did they ever uh, acknowledge them winning the belt, or they just, like, dropped it completely? No, they did. They actually did in the promo. They, they full-on acknowledged that, that he won the belt, and it was taken away from him. Yikes. Well, I mean, it's cool he's doing his solo act, but... Maybe in the future, if he could uh, find another partner, I don't know who that could possibly be to fit his kind of style, but I'm sure there's someone at NXT that may be in line with him, or hell, he can even go with Riddle. You know? Honestly, when as, split. Yeah. Honestly, as weird as it sounds, I wouldn't mind throwing him with Carmelo and Trick. It sounds kind of weird, but... But I don't know. I feel like that that could that could be unique. That could be different. You could. It could be a good, interesting idea. And who knows? It's an idea that's never really been tested. So I don't know. I th- there's many different routes you could go with Wesley, which is why I'm repeating the words: please don't waste his potential. Because this dude didn't do anything wrong, and don't blame him for somebody else's actions. Because that's just not right. At the end of the day. And I'm glad he, he, it looks like he's getting that second chance. So, yeah, that's all I have to say about Wesley. So, now this is going to be the final thing we talk about before heading into our main event. It was, uh, this is about women's wrestling. And I got an interesting question for you both. Is women's wrestling in 2022 getting the proper respect from WWE and AEW. And I don't know. I I feel like both divisions are flawed for completely different reasons. But, Berman, I'll let, I'll let you answer this one. I don't know. This is like an, an ish to me. Like, sometimes they do give them some good respect. Sometimes it sounds like they're going back into the diva days of of WWE, which I hope they don't. It just sounds like they're giving it more like a, like a more, what's what they call it, like comedic sounding for women. Yeah. Sorry to cut hey. you off. I think with women like Ronda, Becky, and Bianca, I definitely think WWE will never go flat out to that divas era, but I get you. Like, they still have those moments that make, like, that scream divas era when it comes to the woman. <laughs> and uh, towards the other side of the AAW, I actually think they give pretty good respect to them. I don't think I've seen a lot of bad things, except uh, I don't think there's a lot of match, a lot of bad things that kind of set me into the diva phase of of AEW right now. I think they are pretty much respecting their women. I don't think there's anything weird about them right now. So I think AEW is WWE is an ish. Okay. What about you, Chris? And for me, I I want to say, from what I've seen on the pay-per-views, at least, I'm not too sure with WWE. I don't really keep up with that. As you see, I'm more of an AEW guy, but I think they're doing okay. It's not, like, great or anything, but there's good matches here and there. I mean, it's not really the women. It's mostly upper management, you know, the writers and whatnot with the bad writing and the bad matches, but they're doing okay as of right now. I think- I think this is another issue that nobody else is really bringing up on on uh, the internet at all. And maybe I'll get backlash for it. Maybe I won't. I think the main issue actually is we have a bunch of men writing for women. And let me explain that, right? At the end of the day, wom- women, men, they, uh, most of the time, they have different psychologies from each other. A man doesn't really know what a woman entirely thinks, just like the way a woman doesn't really know what a man entirely thinks. So wouldn't it be more fair if we actually had women writing for these women's divisions? That's just that's just my personal opinion. I don't know. I would I, I would like if Vince and Tony kind of just backed off of the women's divisions and just let women actually book that shit. But hey, hey, maybe hey, I know. It it it's a bit of a weird take, but that's just my take. Well, 
I think you come in a good uh, side to that. Technically, if you think about movies, they do that. And they work fairly well when women make a movie that is basically all women. They actually but, do a great job at it. So yeah. they should do it for WWE exact same way. Like, for example, whenever I hear, like, you know, Becky, uh, Charlotte, Rhonda speak, I'm like, these aren't what a uh, woman would actually say on a mic. These are men writing scripts for women. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying that. You're not wrong. There's nothing wrong with your opinion, dude. Like, if Tony and Vince just stopped fucking had an ego and just stopped booking the women's divisions and, like I said, actually let women book those damn divisions, I feel like wrestling would be a lot more at peace. Because women would actually know what it would take to give that proper respect to their wrestling division. Men don't know what the fuck they're doing to give women that kind of, you know, respect because they don't know what the fuck women think or want. That's just the truth. So, it's not wrong. So, yeah. And this is what I'm going to say. For WWE, these are my issues. My issues with WWE's women's division is that there are barely ever any feuds without a title all every single woman cares about is the title and it makes every single character almost feel this the exact same because all their motivations are the exact same you get what i mean there yeah i do and then we go over to AEW, right and they haven't had a single uh pay-per-view women's main event match they've had 12 pay-per-views yet not one w- woman's main event on e- any of their pay-per-views. And on top of that, what stars do AEW really have outside of Thunder Rosa and Jade Cargill? Nobody. So at the end of the day, AEW need to get better at creating stars, actually know what the fuck woman would realistically say. <laughs> and Last but not least, give them better storylines. Give them storylines like you give, uh, you know, good effort to the men. So, I don't know. I feel like Serena Deeb and, uh, you know, Sheeta and other talent deserve better writing than they get. So, I don't know. The, uh, the women don't feel as important to me in AEW as they should. And yes, you can argue that they have the Owen Hart Women's Cup. Well, great. That's the first thing for the woman they have done in three years. That's not for the title. So, and, oh, Sheeta versus Deeb is a great feud. No, it's not. That's been going on way too long, and it's at the point where the story is just nonsense at this rate. Like, Deeb is obsessed with Sheeta for what? For what? Because she beat her one time. It's it's causing obsession. That's that's yeah. It's a weird and dumb storyline. And then Revolution should have been where Thunder Rosa won the belt, not a week and a half later. But I digress. So with all that being said, is women's wrestling gained the proper respect it deserves in 2022? No, not from either company. And. That is my personal take. So, now on to the main event. AEW Dynamite 4 slash 27 review. Now, I've been looking back on a lot of these podcasts, and I've recognized I have a very unique comfort score of 7 or 7.5 on most shows. This show might not be very different. It was a good show, but like usual, I have my things to say. What did you guys think about Dynamite before we hop into all of it? I liked it. It's not that bad. Like, there's only like two matches, well, two or three matches that I didn't really like. Uh, And one or two of them that were kind of weird. But I think it was not that bad with all the exceptions of really bad botches in in one match. All right, fair enough. And what about you, Chris? And kind of with, I'm kind of with Berman on this. Like there, there was some good matches, but uh, overall, more excited for this Friday. Funny enough, 
which is which is a first for me. But yeah, we'll right. get into it. Yeah. Yeah, so Friday should be an interesting show, shouldn't it? Well, anyways. Uh let's begin. So I just have to say this show had an amazing first hour and then an absolute mid second hour. And you guys will see what I mean as we start talking about it more. So first hour begins with an Owen Hart Cup match. Special guest commentator CM Punk, FTR collides, Cash Wheeler versus Dax Harwood. All right. All right, all right, all right. I'll go first. This was absolutely amazing. And again, little things matter, people. Like when uh, Dax uh, accidentally hit Cash in the eye with his thumb and, you know, it turned into a bigger deal than, than, you know, a lot of other matches would make it out to be. But because of that friendship and everything, there is that intensity. And yeah, it just made for a simple yet amazing match. And Dax got the win. Very good. They show each other respect afterwards. Punk, I just have to say, hilariously enough, was my favorite commentator of the match. <laughs> if you don't, if you if you can't tell who is who, just call one bald and the other hair. <laughs> yeah, great, great, fun, funny commentary from Punk. But I would say this. Before we say what Punk says, I'm going to give this match a rating and let my other two co-hosts talk about this amazing match. I'm going to give this a 9 out of 10. One of my favorite Dynamite matches this year. Absolutely. So, Chris, what do you think? I wanted to point out, I don't know if you saw the little the little throwback they were having for uh, uh, Bret Hart and his... Uh, yeah, buddy. a lot of the yeah. stuff they were doing in that match was like thrown back to like the WrestleMania 10 match between Bret and Owen and uh, the Owen Hart tribute match from WCW Bret competed in. There were honestly, yeah, many great references and throwbacks in that match. Just they did their homework. They did their homework for this one. And it played I, I, off because you can you can obviously tell there's a lot of things taken back and forth. But uh, one thing you got wrong, Daniel, uh, CM Punk poopy for messing with FTR, and he's just hated on them for no reason. Because what do you mean? No he's just hating on them because they're affiliated with MJF. We're not going to talk That's about that continuity. today. That's continuity. Yeah, that's continuity. What's wrong with that? Everything. Well, anyways, your turn, Ruben. All right. I actually, this is a great match. I I do love all the tributes that happened to Sharpshooter that they thought, oh, no, maybe I shouldn't use a Sharpshooter. And then they kind of did a cool uh, roll-up stuff. And it was really cool. I love the all the power bombs, all the top ropes, and all the uh, back and forth trying to say, hey, we are tag team. But it's kind of like a DIY type of thing that happened with Johnny Gargano and Tommaso Ciampa. These right, two. it reminded me of that match too, actually, yeah. Yeah, really. Like, you're going to get hit hard if you fight, but we still love each other pretty much. And this is what happened at the end. Now, there's one thing, and I'm going to say this, this has pretty much happened the whole entire show, but this made me confused the whole time. In the ring, there's a weird black spot on that, the left, like, left top right, and I never knew what the hell was that. And I made no sense. There was no water. It was just a weird black shadow that had no rhyme or reason to be there. It made me confused, and I just don't know where the hell that came from. Hmm. All right. Interesting. I, I didn't really see any of that. But, uh, hey, um, what do you guys rate this match? Definitely nine. nine. All right. Wow, we all agree on, on this one. Great. So... Punk cut his promo after it was basically confirmed the main event for Double or Nothing 2022 is indeed going to be Punk Page AEW title. And I have to say this, man. Punk still has it on the mic in 2022. And anyone who says otherwise is delusional. And I just have to say it. AEW is in a war with WWE. Adam Page is only 30 years old. We, he can get that title back. CM Punk is 43. We don't know how much time, how much more enjoyment we can get out of CM Punk. But I want to enjoy and embrace every single moment we have left of CM Punk. Because this is one of my favorite wrestlers of all time growing up. And, you know, some of the lessons I learned from the CM Punk character, some of the documentaries he made, etc., 
some of those lessons taught me how to be a better person. And simply put, CM Punk is one of those people WWE massively mistreated. And CM Punk was better than John Cena, but he never got the respect for it. And honestly, I love that AEW is finally giving Punk that John Cena respect WWE could have never given him. And I have to say it, CM Punk needs to win this match at double or nothing. We need one, just a one, at least, CM Punk AEW Championship reign. That, that's, that's just me. I thought the promo was amazing. Mm-hmm. And that's all I really have to say about that. I'll let Chris and Berman discuss this one here. Well, I start first for now. I love the per- promo, and I can't wait to see the match. It's going to be one of the best matches of probably all time. And yes, they. I, I'm a big fan of Sam Punk, and I wish WWE gave him respect he deserved, but they never did. And now AEW is. That's perfect. And that's what AEW needs to do for a lot of people. Yeah, agreed. All right, Chris. I'm more, like you said, I'm, I'm going to be sad if he, he will probably end up winning. But like you said, CM Punk is limited. He's a little older. So we have to give him what it's due for him, what's best for the company. So we'll, we'll let him have it for now because he's just a place over for the real champion anyways. You know. Oh, you know what it is. Yeah. <laughs> But all I have to say this, I feel like the universe will finally be at peace with both Roman Reigns and CM Punk as the top company champions. That's just that, that's just my opinion. I, ah, what a glorious thing to think about! Holy shit! All right, Move, moving on though, moving on. So, uh, with the next thing, we got a Scorpio Sky promo, basically uh, say, saying that. He knows Sammy's history in ladder matches, but he has studied and he is prepared. Now, next up, guest commentator, William Regal, uh, in what is a six-man tag, Blackpool Combat Club versus The Factory. I thought it was good. I didn't think it was amazing by any means, but I genuinely enjoyed this match. And I, of course, love the finish with all three uh, of the Blackpool Combat Club making The Factory tap out. That was great. Um, I don't have to say too much about it. 7 out of 10. All right, I say my piece first. I like the match. I like this kind of a, a hometown boy uh, match because of Wheeler, Wheeler Yuta back in town for his hometown. So I really like that. Um, I gotta say, it definitely is a 7 out of 10. The only thing I kind of I like, uh, another thing I like, I love the Wheeler Yuta's new music. It's perfect for him. And number two, I kind of don't like how the match ended. Like, yes, I like the submission type, but I kind of don't like the we- the seatbelt submi- uh, pin combination. I'm like, maybe a submission. It could have been a better, maybe it was just a submission instead of a pin combination. But I don't have any other gripes, just that. I just have, it's a seven for me. I like that match. And yeah, but besides mm-hmm. that, it was I, I felt it was average. It was okay. It needed to be done. It, it was going to be a squash, but hey, more more wins for you to just give him more of a chance to be upper there, but his name was good, so yeah, can't complain. Seven for me. Alright, seven's all around the board. Now, we had an interview with some of the women's Owen Hart Cup competitors. Uh, Britt Baker, Jamie Hayter, <coughs> um, Tony Storm, and Tony Storm's friend, Ruby Soho. But yeah, they're all basically just talking about how they're in it to win it for the Owen Hart Cup. Uh, Nothing too crazy there. Now we move on to a Jurassic Express interview where Jungle Boy is asked about his loss to Kyle O'Reilly. And he's basically talking how, you know, he didn't get the job done, but he'll get it next time. Then Christian basically said, Jungle Boy, stop. Uh, You're sounding like a loser. But you're not, uh, you're you're not a loser, and put that title uh, on your shoulder where it belongs. Essentially, uh, kind of bossing him around a bit more, as you see. And Christian's been on the losing streak. Jurassic Express been on the winning streak. I think we're gaining for a heel turn, gang. So Christian, as a heel, uh, 
you, you guys you guys like the idea? Okay with it. Yeah, it's not like he's doing anything outside the management, so we'll bring him to the spotlight at least. Yeah, and honestly, Christian has 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 been uh, kind of underrated in his AEW run so far. So I do want to see Christian do more than what he's been doing so far. But I have also been enjoying him a part of the Jurassic Express. So I don't know. I don't know. It is what it is. But like I said, if it gives him more TV time, more of a relevant role on AEW, hey, cool by me. And honestly, I think he uh, fits being a heel really well. So now this next match was great. Lance Archer versus Wardlow. <laughs> this might be Wardlow's best match to date. Wow. A clean Hurricane Rana, a clean Swanton, Power Bomb Symphony. What more can you ask? It was a competitive battle. Wardlow uh, definitely uh, had uh, to give some of an effort right there, but you know, he still looked very strong as well at the same time. So, W's around the board. A great match. Eight and a half out of ten. It's the same thing. Eight and a half. I love the match. I do love how the blackout didn't finish. He just kicked out of the blackout. Tried the goal for a second. Then pretty much just got eight power bombs to the face, pretty much. And I still say it's still bugging me that MGF has never has not yet put a special stipulation on the matches yet that had him maybe still in cuffs or did some type of special, uh, some type of condition. It's still kind of bugging me in that. Right. Like the only thing I have to call out actually about MJF's feuds is, I don't know if you guys have noticed the pattern, but like it started with uh, Jericho, right? Like five labors of Jericho. And then they had Punk, uh, you know, have to be, you know, a few people as well. Uh, so he could compete with Punk. Um, and then, now he's doing the same thing to Wardlow. So, I don't know. And part of me is starting to kind of question how does MJF have that much power to do that for three feuds in a row. But, hey, hey, that's just me. I don't think that it makes a lot of sense. But, yeah, so Chris... What do you have to say about Lance Archer versus Wardlow? Well, I'm, I'm glad that it wasn't just like another easy win for Wardlow. They actually gave Lance Archer a proper match because I was like, oh. Which I knew they would. Which I knew they would. Yeah. I mean, in the back of my head, I was like, Tony Khan, don't you dare. Don't you dare make this like a five minute less match. But, you know, Wardlow did great. I'm a big fan of him. And maybe for uh, Berman, when they do that special um, rule set, maybe they'll be in double or nothing. Maybe they're saving that, possibly. I'm not too sure, but yeah, it is a bit weird. He hasn't done anything that weird on Warload or whatever. Makes sense what you think, what you just said. So, hey, I'm waiting for it. It would be an MJF type of move. Yeah, so it definitely looks like we're, we're getting MJF versus Wardlow at double or nothing. 100%. That's going to be really fun. Um... So yeah, Chris, what do you think about what do you rate this match? I'm gonna give it an eight out of ten. All right, sweet. Now, okay, this was my favorite part of the entire show. The Jericho Appreciation Society. Call out Ortiz, Santana, and Kingston. And you know, uh the Jericho Appreciation Society is, you know, purposefully you know, being annoying to Eddie Kingston, Santana, and Ortiz, Daniel Garcia getting all up in Kingston's face, telling him to hit him, trying to do everything in his power to get Kingston's attention, but Kingston just ain't for it. Then Santana and Ortiz called out Jericho saying, you turned your back on the two people that know you most, and that was the biggest mistake you could have ever done. And then when we go over to Kingston, he finally gets his chance to speak. And Jesus Christ. He kind of exposed Chris Jericho's character here for deep down really fearing Eddie Kingston. Eddie really said, uh, you don't know what a hit really means. A hit in my world means basically taking you out. Any means necessary. And he said he could have smelled the fear off of Chris Jericho because Jericho is a bitch, simply put. And he didn't phrase all these things exactly like this, but those were essentially his points. This is definitely one of my favorite Eddie Kingston promos to date. Wow. 
wow, why, why is this man not the TNT champion? Why? Just Jesus Christ, man. So good. So good. What do you guys think about this promo? I love the mat. I love it. It's a great promo from Kingston. I always love when he, Kingston talks. He's a street talker, I call him. I gotta say, I love the part when he's just, uh, Kingston was in Jericho's face, and as soon as G Kingston leaves Jericho's face, his eyes are wide open. It just makes him so, like, it just makes him funny, but, like, looks like he's so scared out of his mind. Yeah, because that was the point that, like, Kingston absolutely exposed Jericho's character right there. And I also forgot to mention the part where, where he tells, uh, I think it was either uh, Daddy Magic or Angelo Parker, basically telling them on his mother to shut up. <laughs> that was great as well. Just, ah, man. So, this was just, this was the peak of the show for me. It was, dude. And I also like the fact that that Chris say, did that low blow on Eddie King saying, like, hey, what about this company? You're nothing. You have nothing to go to. And I'm just like, dude, that's a low fucking yeah. blow. No, yeah. Jericho went, like, went. Yikes. Jericho had some shit to say, too, in this promo. Yeah, it wasn't just Kingston. But, yeah, this went from being a feud I semi-cared about to a feud I completely care about. I, my, this feud has my full-on attention from here on out after what they did tonight. And that this promo is not all they did tonight. We'll get to what else happened with them later in the show oh my god so yeah that was the first hour right holy crap they used punk brian moxley kingston jericho right almost all of their big stars if you think about it so the second hour was kind of doomed before we even got to it so let's talk about the second hour sammy guevara cuts the same promo that he did last week about Scorpio being irrelevant, talks about the love of his life, the TNT title. Simply put, his promos are getting a bit repetitive. But now we move on to the Owen Hart, Women's Owen Hart Cup, Philly Street Fight, Sheeta versus Deeb. Um, yeah, I mean, I, we all knew why this match went long this week. It's because of the Becky Lynch interview uh, and, you know, why Ruby Soho also appeared this week. It's, again, because of the Becky Lynch interview. And, yeah, th that's why this match probably felt like the longest on the entire show. It, it didn't really do anything for me. I, it wasn't the worst match I've ever seen, but it wasn't the best. I just felt very indifferent on it. I'm going to give this a five and move on. All right, I'm going to say some few things really quickly. I liked the match. It's not that bad. I don't, maybe the thing I'm going to get hit a lot of hate from this, but I do not like Sheeta. I do respect her from being this champion, but I really don't like Sheeta. I like Sharita, uh, Serena D a lot better. And I'm okay. I love that Serena D actually won it. I think she's supposed, she was supposed to be the one we wanted. I'll give it a six just because I like how the end of the match. And I also do like that they kind of set up uh, Thunder Rosa's next challenger. Serena Deep. And if that's the match we're getting at double or nothing, sign me up. I'm down. Honestly, and I'm kind of with Berman. I mean, I do like Sheeta as a wrestler, but like this whole Sheeta and Serena Deep feud just needs to end. It's it's not cool. It's not funny. Hopefully. And hopefully soon, but we'll see. But it was okay. It was like a four at best. Right. Like we're all three records on repeat talking about this stinking feud now. Yeah. Well. Now, next up, MJF made a call, and Berman, would you like to talk about who he called? Yes, sir, Re. You can't teach that. That's going to no, be the... you can't. Yeah, that is going to be Big Casts, or what now he's called, W. Morrissey. That is from Impact Wrestling. I can't wait to see this match. This is probably should be the step up from Lance Archer's match. That's an eight and a half. It should be probably up there again at that eight and a half. This should be a great match. I, I, I honestly, and interestingly enough, I talked to Berman about this before the podcast began. I have not watched any of his work since uh, WWE. So I, I've heard he's improved a lot, improved enough to the point where people don't even want him to really reunite with Enzo. He's strong enough as a solo act, apparently, which is great to hear. And the one compliment 
I could always say about him, even back in WWE, was that he had really damn good mic skills. I remember that. <laughs> he had really good mic skills. And honestly, like I said, if they do bring in Enzo, uh, like a, uh, maybe he could be like a nice little addition to the show. Obviously not a main event attraction, uh, but he could definitely be a fun little you know, a uh, manager or a tag team partner or, uh, you know, uh, whatever you want to do with him. He could be a fun little mid-carder on the show, you know. And that's just how I yeah. see it, so. I say the same thing. And another thing, I gotta say, he definitely improved on that promo skill and impact. I gotta say that, too. Very nice. Very nice. So, yeah, we'll have to see what happens next week with Wardlow. Now, uh, next up, Phoenix has returned, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. House of Black took out Fuego del Sol. And it looks like that was all the promo was about to be. But then uh, something uh, looked like it was dressed up as Alex, his witch persona. And he finally confirmed this witch persona is a joke. And it was literally used as a distraction until the right time finally came. And now the right time has come. Death Triangle is back all together because Phoenix is back and it looks like double or nothing. We're getting the match that we were supposed to get at revolution and that's Dust triangle versus house of black. Uh, so yeah, uh, I think it'll be fun. At least it's something somewhat interesting for house of black to do. So yeah, Berman, uh, what do you think about the return of Phoenix? Happy. I love Phoenix, and in our Who's Better, I represent Phoenix. So I got I always love watching Phoenix, and I, I'm happy that he's back. And I'm hoping that he gets a uh, he gets in the Death Triangle, and he gets a lot of uh, respect, and gets a lot of great matches with them. Indeed, indeed. And uh, another thing I have to say is yes. Berman did mention who was better. We have a episode coming on the way soon. Rey Mysterio versus Rey Phoenix, where I represent Rey Mysterio. He represents Rey Phoenix. Chris is the judge. That'll be coming out sometime next week. So be on the lookout for that banger. But yeah, so Chris, you excited for Death Triangle versus House of Black and oh, the you, return of Phoenix? Oh, you bet, dude. When I saw that, I was like, oh, we're going to do this. This whole Fuego thing was pointless, but I never popped so hard in my life. Dude. I'm glad they're back. And I'm hoping think, this yeah. match lives up. The Fuego thing was basically a distraction. Damn. <laughs> Using Fuego as fucking clickbait. That's mean. It is mean, but it is what it is. True. Next, we have an interview with Swerve and Darby. And looks like they are the next Owen Hart Cup match. They're happening this they're facing off this Friday on Rampage. Uh, oh my gosh, that will be a great match. Um, I think Darby's taking the W here. What do you guys think? I hope so. I love Darby, and I hope that he gets more Ws and more Ws until he get, gets into finals. For Same. sure. For Same sure. Here. I mean, I like Swerve, but Darby needs to get up there. It's his time now. Yeah, Swerve just something. came into the company. So, uh, you know, maybe the own heart cup. Uh, isn't his thing. I already have my own heart cup winner in mind, though. So it's not going to be either of these two. But I think this will be a great match. And I think the winner, whoever it may be, will at least uh, uh, have a fair enough match in the first round of the tournament if they lose. So, yeah. This should be a banger. Now, uh, the Undisputed Elite in a 10-man tag take on Lee Johnson, Dante Martin, Brock Anderson and Varsity Blondes. This was decent. It was it wasn't anything too crazy. And okay, even though I shit on the Young Bucks like every single week, I'm not gonna lie. They kind of carried this match for me. I am kind of actually getting a little interested in you know them not feeling entirely confident in themselves because it is a different angle for the Young Bucks to say the least. And I know I'm in the minority in that field, but. I personally hate them as heels. And I mean, I hate them as faces as well. <laughs> but if I'm, if I'm, they're, they're less, let me just say this they're more tolerable as faces. Okay. That's just the best way to put it. This match is a six. The Undisputed Elite shirts are bomb, though. 
I would so, say right now. Sorry. One second. Oh, no. Uh, You're all good. Um, I give this a 6-2. I like the match. It was actually good. I like how they did the four-way V-trigger combination and then the boom finish. That was a good, that was a good finish, how they did that. And I got to say, probably the Young Bucks got their confidence back, I would say. It's, all right. It's all thanks to the varsity blogs because they're absolutely worthless. <laughs> <laughs> but it is what it is. It, it was okay. A five at best for me. You guys see how we're lo- rating the hour two matches a lot lower than the hour one matches? Oh, well, it's about to get worse, buddy. It's just too yeah. late. They're throwing too much in the first hour of the show. <clears throat> and I've noticed the structure recently, right? They start the show with punk. Then they go to some Blackpool Combat Club. Then they go uh, to, like, you know, other talent like Eddie Kingston and Jericho. Like, I'm starting to recognize a little technique here with their show structure. I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but I just wanted to point that out. So, with all that being said, this was uh, to continue what happened with Kingston and Jericho. Kingston got a freaking fireball thrown at his face. And it was to make fun, it was to parody and make fun of uh, Alexa Bliss throwing the fireball at Randy Orton from last year. And I just got to say, the difference between this and that was this actually felt intense. This wasn't magic. This was someone doing something reckless and dangerous just to hurt the other individual here. He literally burned Eddie Kingston's face. Crazy, crazy crazy part of the show again this has my full-blown attention now on to the main event oh boy tnt championship ladder match sammy guevara versus scorpio sky now for the first five minutes or so this match was going fine you know uh they got they did a german suplex on the on the ramp that was cool they did a few other cool things but the match all went downhill when sammy guevara Said he's crazy. And you know, this time he really paid the consequences for trying to be crazy. As he did a corkscrew 630 and absolutely landed very horribly. And Scorpio, it looked like he kind of tried to catch him, but I guarantee you Scorpio didn't know what was actually about to happen. Um, so yeah, and, you could, and throughout the entire picture in picture, Sammy Guevara couldn't even stand. Like, he got to his knee to knock the, the ladder down, uh, Sky off the ladder. And then there would be, like, little assists from Ty Conti just to, you know, kill time so the refs can keep on checking on Sammy. Like, he was absolutely concussed. And I do not think the match should have really continued. But with that being said, even though I don't like Sammy Guevara, I respect the fact that he finished this match after getting a concussion. Again, though, I don't think it should have been allowed. But, more positives. Scorpio Sky countering Sammy's ladder cutter into his own cutter was just really thought out. And it really, you know, made what he said earlier matter how he studied Sammy's ladder match moments. So, it made Scorpio look pretty smart here. Now, Conti and... Paige Van Zant brawling, some of that was kind of cool. The roundhouse kicks to each other was kind of cool. They should actually have a decent match, I think. I'm not even going to lie at this point. But, well, hey. Uh, at the end of the day, though, that Sammy also screwed up his uh, neck uh, even worse because he couldn't do the backflip for the Spanish fly. And I couldn't blame him. He was, he was clearly just not 100%. And... Then, to end the disaster off, Sammy gets thrown off of a ladder onto a barbed wire ladder, only to freaking no-sell it and instantly get up and springboard from the ropes onto a ladder just for Sky to knock him down off the ladder onto nothing and just grab the title. What a pointless, stupid ending. It should have clearly ended with A, either the cutter, because Sammy was hurt, and the cutter would have been a cool ending, or B, after the barbed wire spot, because he should not be instantly getting up from that. This main event was a disaster. And I, like I said, man, I have to just say this. 
it's okay for Sammy Guevara to do these crazy spots, right? But he has to be a bit more cautious and a bit more selective about those spots or else he's not going to see the age of 40. Just want to say it. So, yeah, once again, he's, he seems okay now, but I don't know, man. That, that, looked, that looked reckless. I, just, I was just too nervous to watch the rest of the match. This is a 3 out of 10. And I, th- I think I'm being nice with that score, but 3 out of 10. Berman, your thoughts? I go quick on this one. I, I I was okay. I actually liked the match. It was pretty good, and then I think there's a good TNT match to maybe change this TNT Championship look into a real TNT Championship, the the open challenge type of championship. I'm hoping they do this. I'm hoping they can just change this whole thing and just give it away and give it away to the open challenge bits. Yes. All this shit happened in this match. It was very bad. And this is not the same. This is not the only time this happened to Sammy. He had done so many stupid things that made him so much more hurt, in, yeah. including the match with uh, Scorpio Sky. The first one did the exact same thing. His stupidity cost himself the win and probably hurt himself very badly. Like, yes, so, one of these guys are going to die on national yeah. television. And like, and, and the crazy thing is, AEW keeps actually reposting uh, the clip of him doing that corkscrew six thirty where he misses. It's like they're proud of that spot. Even if I like the match, I'm gonna give it one rating up than yours, and that's a four, just because I actually like the match. And with all the counters that kind of did, yes, all the dumb things that happened with Sammy, I'm concerned about him, but he still performed great. He's kind of like a Mick Foley that he just damaged himself, but he kept on going. So, I got it. I'm going to give it a four. All right. And for Chris to wrap this all up. And I'll be brief, too. It it was kind of disappointing. I mean, I don't know if it's just you guys, but Sammy just hasn't really been, like, wrestling at his best. He's just kind of been reckless for these basketball He's been months. off after. He's been off, yeah. And it, it's sad because I'm rooting for this guy. I mean, I don't want him to actually get hurt. I mean, yeah, he can go crazy or whatever, but if you're not properly doing it, you might end up, I hate to say, it's like maybe like a blue blazer instance where you possibly get yourself killed during a pay-per-view and you wouldn't want to do that just for like a little fame yeah. or whatever. Right, but, and then like the difference with blue blazer was that that was like him doing a special entrance. Like that wasn't even like his fault because it was like tested for multiple times. That, that you can't say the same for Sammy Guevara because he's just doing it on purpose. Well, I hope he's not, but he's just like he just doesn't care. It's just like, dude, like you just need to relax. Like I get it, you're the Spanish guy like, and all. Like, but... I don't like him as as a wrestler and whatnot, but that doesn't mean I'm gonna wish for the dude to get hurt. So, yeah, hope he's all good. What's your rating, Chris? Uh, it was pretty bad too. And also one last thing. Uh, I, I don't like the fact that, you know, Ty Conti and the other lady were kind of getting involved. It was more distracting than anything, but I get it. They're buying time. So for what it is, it, it was yeah. okay. Like, look at you. I, I give now to end it off with some uh, on a positive note. Congratulations to Scorpio Sky for not exactly becoming a two-time TNT champion, but for actually winning me over. I've finally recognized this dude is a professional, and the way he wrestled with Sammy uh, last night really was the safest he could have possibly wrestled after that happened. Like, I saw him, like, slow, like, climb the ladder as slow as possible multiple times throughout because I know, like, you know, he was trying to give Sammy that time. And, you know, like I said, of course the match absolutely suffered, but at the end of the day, Scorpio was the redeeming quality of it. And honestly, uh, with... Uh, him impressing me more with some surprising character development throughout all of this, he's kind of won me over. I still like Ethan Page more, but congrats to Scorpio Sky for finally winning some fans over, myself included. And yeah, that's all I really have to say. So thank you all for watching this podcast. Um, Scorpio Sky will be facing Frankie Kazarian for the TNT Championship in the future. We don't know when, but yeah. AEW overall for me was a seven. What do you guys give it actually? Seven, yeah, I would say give, I'll give it seven too. I'll do the same. All right, all right, yeah. So thank you all for watching, and uh, I've been Daniel. 
I've been Chris. And I've been Berman. And we'll see you all in the next episode.